Movies are a visual medium, and therefore most movies' major characters are, well, visible to the audience. But as with any rule, there are notable exceptions. And to prove it, these are just a few memorable examples of film characters you never see. Thanks to the success of the original Charlie's Angels television series, which ran from 1976 to 1981, a film reboot was inevitable. In 2000, director McGee's adaptation, which starred Cameron Diaz, Drew Barrymore, and Lucy Liu, hit theaters. As the titular team, working out of an exclusive agency in Los Angeles, the trio lent the film the feel of the original television series while setting it in a more modern era and stretching one mystery into a longer story. As in the original series, Charlie is perpetually unsafe scene, accessible only through speaker and identified only as the Angel's millionaire boss who finds them different jobs, gives them instructions, and works through his assistant Bosley. Though the film never addresses why Charlie isn't present, aside from indicating that he's frequently targeted by villains and assassins, the closing scene shows a man quietly observing the Angels, who could be Charlie himself, though he remains obscured to the viewer. So Charlie, how will we ever know you really truly exist unless you come down here and have a coconut with us? <laughs> Faith, angels. It's called Faith. Spike Jones is known for his inventive, ambitious projects, and 2013's Her, which won Best Original Screenplay at the 86th Academy Awards, as well as scoring a nomination for Best Picture, tackles the concept of artificial intelligence from an entirely new perspective. Set just slightly ahead of the present day, the film imagines a time when humans are able to create virtual assistants using artificial intelligence. Theodore, played by Joaquin Phoenix, feels disconnected from the people around him after a rough divorce until he meets Samantha. I can understand how the limited perspective of an unartificial mind would perceive it that way. You'll get used to it. <laughs> As Theodore gets closer to his AI assistant Samantha, seductively voiced by Scarlett Johansson, he realizes that the relationship isn't as special as he previously thought. She admits that she's in similar relationships and in love with hundreds of other people before telling him that she and the other AIs are leaving the human sphere. As society creeps closer to the advent of new forms of artificial intelligence, the unseen assistants of her become even more relevant, warning audiences about the benefits and costs of technology that may soon become a reality. Adapted from Ira Levin's novel, Roman Polanski's horror classic Rosemary's Baby stars Mia Farrow as Rosemary, a woman who believes a satanic cult wants to use her baby for evil purposes. When Rosemary and her husband Guy move into their new apartment in New York City, they befriend an odd elderly couple who welcomes the young pair with open arms. However, throughout the film, Rosemary becomes suspicious of them, and as she experiences a truly horrific pregnancy, she realizes that her child is not her husband's, but actually the son of the devil, and she must raise the child as her own to appease this dangerous cult. Read what they do, Guy. They use blood in their rituals, and the blood that has the most power is baby's blood. During the film's finale, Rosemary discovers that her child is the son of Satan, who chose her to carry his baby, and rather than show the baby directly, there's simply a flash of a demonic face, perhaps the child's father, Satan. What have you done to its eyes? He has his father's eyes. In refusing to show an actual shot of the child, the film leaves its appearance up to the imagination, making it even more frightening than, say, a potentially unrealistic prosthetic demon baby. The second film in the long-running Ernest film series, Ernest Saves Christmas, features Jim Varney's character Ernest and serves as the holiday-themed installment in the franchise. Ernest, who appeared in several commercials for brands like Coca-Cola and Chex, made his mark by always delivering an impassioned, off-topic monologue to his friend Vern while speaking directly to the camera, which always culminated in him proclaiming the virtues of whatever product he happened to be pitching. <laughs> Got him, Vern. Another Pacific Pilsner. That's a keeper. In Ernest Saves Christmas, Ernest, a taxi driver working in Florida, inadvertently picks up Santa Claus and accidentally gains possession of Santa's magic sack of toys. Through a series of misadventures, he helps find the next man who will become Santa Claus and makes sure Christmas goes smoothly. And also throughout the film, he delivers his trademark monologues to Vern, whose POV is once again provided by the camera. During one notable scene, he even helps host a Christmas party at Vern's house, much to Vern's apparent chagrin. Ho, 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 Vern! Merry I thought you said this Vern was a friend of yours. No, oh, Vern's just like that. He'll do anything for a laugh. Okay, so chances are you already know the whole story of Romeo and Juliet. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. 
But in case you've been living under a rock, here goes. Romeo and Juliet, respective heirs to the warring Montague and Capulet families, meet by chance at a party and immediately fall in love, even though they're conditioned to hate one another, and even though Juliet is already engaged to someone else. Though they do their best to make a new life together, their plans are foiled at every turn, and they eventually do the whole poison-slash-dagger thing and yada yada yada. You know how this one turns out. Poison! I'll kiss thy lips! Aptly some poison doth ya hang on him. Ah, oh, crap. Wrong movie. Hold tight. The play has seen plenty of adaptations over the years, but the most popular among modern viewers is Baz Luhrmann's fantastical Romeo and Juliet, which modernizes the set and costumes while retaining the original prose. It's pretty weird, and it shouldn't work, but honestly, somehow it does. They have made worms meat of me. A plague on both your houses! Though most know the narrative outline, it's easy to forget that Juliet isn't always the only girl on Romeo's mind. In fact, when the story begins, Romeo is heartsick over another girl, Rosalind, who seemingly won't give him the time of day. When his friend Mercutio encourages him to attend Juliet's party so he can forget about Rosalind, Romeo's former love is forgotten and, in fact, never appears in the play or film at all. Still, she plays a relatively important part in the whole tragic mess. If she hadn't left Romeo heartbroken, he may never have even met Juliet. Yet. 2010's Winter's Bone introduced Jennifer Lawrence to mainstream film audiences. Set in the Ozarks, this low-budget drama stars Lawrence as Ree, who is solely responsible for taking care of her mentally ill mother as well as her two younger siblings. While she attempts to teach her siblings how to survive, she's also tasked with finding her father, who has disappeared after his arrest for making meth. And the stakes are high. If she doesn't find him in time, then her family's house and land will be seized, leaving them with a week to find somewhere else to live. Along the way, she runs afoul of the town crime boss, Milton, while everyone tells her that her father is already dead, and she tries to figure out what the real story is even as bondsmen hunt him down. Some of our blood at least is the same. Ain't that supposed to mean something? Isn't that what is always said? As it turns out, everyone is right. Her father is, in fact, dead, as Reed discovers when the Milton clan shows her his body partially submerged in a lake. Left only with his hands to identify him to the sheriff and bondsman, Reed's journey is over and she can be at peace. But her unseen father's character remains vital to the story, as searching for him to save her family is what drives her throughout the entire narrative. The 1964 classic Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, sprung from the mind of legendary director Stanley Kubrick. This dark comedy focuses on a Cold War-era nuclear conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. Starring legends Peter Sellers and George C. Scott, the film's central conflict hinges upon a deranged general who orders a nuclear strike by the United States against the Soviet Union, and the efforts of the United States president and his cabinet to then try and stop the strike. Though this might not sound like a laugh riot, it. The script and Sellers' multiple performances are so hilarious that the film has become known as one of cinema's best comedies, earning itself a place in the National Film Registry and the third spot on the 100 Years 100 Laughs list at AFI. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Because the film centers on a conflict between the U.S. and Soviet Union, one might think the Russian premiere would be fairly central. But thanks to the focus on the United States government's response, premier Dmitry Kissoff is ultimately never seen, providing most of the film's push and pull without ever having to physically appear on screen, and existing only through phone calls to and from the president. Uh, we're doing a documentary yeah. about the Blair Witch. Oh. Oh, have you heard of the Blair Witch? Oh yeah, that, that's an old, old, old story. One of the first forays into the modern era of the found footage subgenre of horror films, The Blair Witch Project, was filmed over only eight days, stranding actors in the woods with handheld equipment to lend an air of authenticity to the frightening story. I'm not playing head games, man. If anyone's playing head games, you're playing head games, but I'm not playing head games. In fact, the viral marketing campaign was almost too successful, including the decision to keep the actors from attending the film's premiere and listing them as deceased on IMDb. The production was a real-life horror in its own right. The actors were intentionally deprived of food and pranked by the crew to elicit real reactions for the final product. Help! Help! Please help us! Help us! 
In the low-budget, high-scares flick, a group of amateur filmmakers, Heather, Mike, and Josh, document their search for the mysterious Blair Witch. Though they're initially skeptical of any supernatural phenomena, during their time in the woods, they're tormented by some unseen force. When Josh goes missing, it appears as if the Blair Witch herself is mimicking his screams to lure Heather and Mike. After they find an abandoned house, Mike's camera footage ends, and Heather finds him silently standing in a corner just before she's attacked herself. As the film progresses, it becomes clear why the Blair Witch is never seen. It's simply far scarier that way. Based on the 1944 Pulitzer-winning stage play of the same name by Mary Chase, the 1950 film Harvey stars James Stewart and Josephine Hull and tells a rather unconventional tale. Stewart plays Elwood P. Dowd, a cheerful, friendly lush with one very unique characteristic. His best friend is a six-foot-tall, invisible rabbit named Harvey. Though Elwood's family, including his sister and niece, are exasperated and concerned by Elwood's imaginary friend, his appealingly pleasant demeanor leads to Elwood making friends at his neighborhood bar, where the bartender always greets Harvey and serves Elwood two martinis. Naturally, the absence of the film's title character is what drives the entire story, as Elwood's family, fearing for his well-being and sanity, has him committed to an institution to help potentially cure him. However, over time, Elwood's doctor, Dr. Chumley, begins to believe Elwood and believe in Harvey. At first, Dr. Chumley seemed a little frightened of Harvey, but that gave way to admiration as the evening wore on. In the end, Elwood's loved ones save him from a medicine that would make him normal and stop him from seeing his beloved bunny bestie. The film was incredibly well-reviewed, leaving a lasting lesson that imagination is not a flaw, but something that can bring real joy to anyone if they'd only believe. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon! Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one!